Welcome, welcome to church on this beautiful Easter morning. A special welcome to any visitors. Please join us for coffee and fellowship after the service. Uh, one announcement today is the visitation for Tini Vandenberg tonight from 7 to 9 here in the fellowship hall, and the funeral is tomorrow at 2. Also here in this church. This morning we will be, we'll, we will be led in song by Go and Be and in word by Pastor Wes. Let's give wholehearted praise to our risen Savior.
Good morning. He is risen. There it is. First Peter 1, verses 3 to 9, for our call to worship this morning. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith the salvation of your souls. Receive God's greeting. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our opening song, Reckless Love. All right. Uh, me and uh, Denise are just going to go over something here to introduce Reckless Love. We've sang it here before, but we just thought we'd... Yeah. We had a, a, our praise team had a conversation over the word, word reckless, and uh, can God's attributes really be reckless? Can God himself, when God himself is not reckless? So God himself is not reckless, but from a human perspective, God's love can sometimes almost appear reckless. He will leave the 99 to go after the lost sheep every single time. Then that led us to Luke 15, where Jesus tells a parable about the shepherd who left the 99 good sheep to go after the one lost sheep. When we think about a modern, modern day shepherd, it would be considered reckless to leave 99 healthy sheep just to go after that one lost sheep.
climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't get down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't get down. If you want, you can turn in your Bibles uh, in the pew to a passage that I want to just share with you, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Ephesians chapter 2. Having just sang about the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, here is a passage that testifies to this love, this love that God showed us of all people. So here's how it goes. Ephesians 2, beginning verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Just to pause there for a minute. Did you catch what um, Paul said there? We once were followers of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Do you know who that is? Satan. We were once followers of Satan. That's what Paul's saying here. We used to worship Satan. Of course, we deserved to be punished. We deserved God's wrath. But then listen to this. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, his reckless love, God, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, followers of Satan... It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. How did that happen? How did we receive this grace? It was through Jesus Christ, who shed his blood on the cross. On the, the cross, he shed his blood and so God's love ran red. Please join in our next song, At the Cross, Love Ran Red.
this time, I would like to invite the children up to the front. They're going to lead us in singing a song. After that, we're going to have our kids' time. So all the kids, come on down to the front. As the kids are making their way down here, they're going to lead us in a song that uh, they've learned, He Arose. And for this song, the kids are going to sing the chorus, and we are going to sing the verses to this song, He Arose. Good morning. Okay. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You have to yell it when someone says that. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You could say it all or just the second part. Yeah. So, uh, of course, what's the, what's the big deal today? What's so special about today? You were all just singing about it. You tell me, and I just gave it away when I said he is risen. What's so special about today, Easter Sunday? Yep. Who rose from the dead? Who rose from the dead? 
Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Raise your hand if you believe that. Okay. I have a Yeah, go ahead. That's right, yeah, yeah. They crucified Jesus, and Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. But three days later, you, you just sang about it. He arose. He arose. Okay? Now, i got to tell you a story. I, I had a dog when I was young. His name was Austin. He was a shih tzu. And one day, Austin was out playing near the road, and we used to live on a busy road. Cars were going down that road. And there was Austin, he ran off to the road, and I yelled, Austin! Just as a car was coming, did Austin listen to me? No. <laughs> you got smoked by the car. Austin is dead. I was very upset about that. And my parents, they wanted to have hot dogs for dinner that night. I said, no! So we're not gonna do that. We're gonna bury my dog, Austin. So I buried the dog, Austin, who was dead. <coughs> Three days later, Austin rose from the dead. The dog came to life and ran home. Now raise your hand if you believe anything that I just said. <laughs> Nobody. I didn't see your hand, Jude. <laughs> of course you didn't believe that. Why didn't you believe what I just told you? What I told you wasn't true. How do you know it wasn't true? Because it's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. And here's the thing. God has given you the gift of faith. And by faith, you kind of know what's true and what's not true. By faith, we know Jesus rose from the dead. And you also know that Austin, my dog, was not hit by a car. He did not die and rise from the dead. That is not true. You just know this by faith. You know what is true. What is true? He is risen from the dead. We'll work on it. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of faith. With this faith, we believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and that he rose from the dead. We believe this with all our heart. Your word says it and we believe it. Thank you for opening our eyes to see this and believe this. I pray that this truth would continue to transform each of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. At this time, you may all stand to give us the blessing. You're going to say, may the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Have a great Easter Sunday. Our Bible reading today is from Matthew 28, 1 to 15. It is on page 1549 in your pew Bibles. I'll lead you in a prayer of illumination. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word today as we read Matthew's account of the day your son, our Lord, rose from the grave. Open our hearts and minds so its teachings as Pastor West leads us in spirit and in truth. Amen. After the Sabbath, at the dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for our Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. 
Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Immediately following the, the resurrection, there were two groups of people who went to go and share what they had seen with, with others. So the, the first group, which we just heard from Matthew 28, 1 to 10, was the women. And the women, once they saw what they saw, they went to go tell the disciples. That's the first group. Now, there was a second group as well. And this is in verses 11 to 15. The guards because the guards saw something as well. And when they saw what they saw, they went to the chief priests to tell them what they had, what they had seen. Let me um, share these verses with you. Matthew 28, 11 to, to 15. If you want, you can follow in the Bible again. We can look at the Bible a lot. Matthew 28, beginning verse 11. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Now the reason I, I'm sharing you these words is because this is what the sermon this morning is based on. Uh, the report of the guards to the chief priests, what the guards saw and what, what they went on to say. Now of course to understand more of what's going on in this passage, Matthew 28, we have to back up a tad to the end of chapter 27. So after Jesus died, they took his body off the cross, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and then placed it in a new tomb. Now the, the chief priests, they were concerned that Jesus' disciples would come along and spread the lie that Jesus, uh, his body was stolen. They were concerned that the disciples would steal the body of Jesus. And so to keep that from happening... Um, they went to Pilate, the governor, they explained their concern, and they requested that Pilate give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day, verse 64, at the end of chapter 27. Um, and then Pilate then told them to take Agar, just one of them, and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. And apparently, I guess, to make sure the disciples wouldn't steal the body, they, they posted not just one guard, but several guards. Chapter 28, verse 4, mentions guards, plural. And of course, it is the guards, again in verse 11, guards, plural, who go to the chief priests to report what they had seen. And what did they see? Well, they didn't see Jesus. Jesus only appeared to the women. But they did see something incredible. Verse, uh, verses 2 to 4. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning 
and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So the guards, they were just standing around. They were not sleeping. Then there was a violent earthquake. Then the angel appeared, uh, whose appearance was like lightning. The angel rolled back the stone and sat on it. Then all the guards passed out, uh, which is what Matthew means by the phrase, they became like dead men. They, they saw the angel. Presumably they didn't hear what the angel said because they all blacked out. When they came to, they all got up and then they went to the chief priests to tell them what had happened. And this is where we see something truly unbelievable happen. After hearing the guards report, the chief priests are still not convinced that Jesus has risen from the dead. These guards arrive to tell them that they have seen an angel. And this is not just one guard, but this is several guards who are saying this. If this was just one guard, you would dismiss it. That guard is obviously delusional and has lost their mind. But this is not coming from just one. This is coming from all of them. They have all seen this, this angel who, who appeared. The body is now missing. And the chief priests, they don't repent and become followers of Christ. Rather, verse 12, they met with the elders to devise a plan to keep the truth concealed. And their plan was to give the guards a large sum of money and then have them go around telling everyone that the disciples came during the night and stole the body while they were sleeping. This is clearly not true. And I don't think you would need Columbo to tell you that this story just doesn't add up. You know, when someone is asleep, they have no idea what's going on. And these guards are supposed to say that while they were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body? Well, that just raises the question. If you were sleeping, how did you know what the disciples were doing? The cover-up is clearly a lie. And the guards know it. I mean, the guards know what they saw. They saw an angel. And now the body is missing. So obviously, they're not going to go along with this plan, right? They will probably all become followers of Christ now that they know the truth, right? Wrong. Verse 15 says, So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. The resurrection of Jesus is the most incredible thing that we read about in the Bible, but, you know, in Matthew 28. Um, but what I also find incredible in this chapter is the unbelief of the chief priests and the guards. How could the chief priests not believe? They hear a report, not from one person, but from several, that an angel has appeared and that the body of Christ has gone missing. Is it not clear that something miraculous has just happened? Apparently not. And how about the guards? How could the guards not believe? They see an angel, they know the truth, then they agree to go around spreading a lie. And they know it's a lie. Their unbelief is unbelievable. How could they not get it? You know, in the resurrection account, we see the Lord at work in more than just one way. Uh, he was most clearly at work when he raised his son, Jesus, from death to life. Um, but he was also at work in other ways as well. For example, he opened the eyes of the women, and he opened the eyes of the disciples, so that they would believe that Jesus has risen. Now, this is true in, in all the accounts, but especially, perhaps, in Luke 24. In Luke 24, there's that passage where Jesus, after he rose from the dead, he appears to to two guys who are traveling on their way to Emmaus. And in the passage, it says that these two guys were kept from recognizing him. 
But after walking together and talking together and eating together, we then hear verse 31 of Luke 24. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But whereas the Lord opened the eyes of these believers in Luke 24 and in the other passages, here in our passage, Matthew 28, the Lord closes the eyes of the guards and the chief priests. Or you could say he, he kept their eyes closed. So the Lord was at work in the lives of these unbelievers. He was keeping their eyes closed. Now, obviously, we know that the Lord is the one who opens eyes. But throughout Scripture, we also see that the Lord is the one who closes eyes as well. In John 12, verse 40, it says, He, the Lord, has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. Or how about the, uh, the story of the Exodus. When you read through that story, it says it loud and clear several times, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. On an important theological side note, the Lord closes the eyes of those who want their eyes closed. The Lord rejects those who reject him. For example, 2 Thessalonians 2 10 to 11, says they perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. Uh, God sends the powerful delusion to, to those who refuse to love the truth. And we see this in our, in our passage, Matthew 28, 1 to, 1 to 15. Uh, the chief priests, they refused to love Jesus, who is the truth. And so the Lord sends them this powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. And they believe the lie and they spread the lie. Now, I'm not sure you remember, but there was a time in our lives when we were no different than the guards and the chief priests. Colossians 1.21 tells us that we were once enemies of the Lord. And as enemies, we refused to love the truth. But here's the thing that surprises me. This is God's reckless love for you. He did not send us a powerful delusion to keep us believing the lie. What did, what did he send us? He sent us Jesus Christ, his son. He sent us the Holy Spirit. He gave us the gift of faith. He opened our eyes. Us, of all people, his enemies. Or to put this all another way, in Ephesians 2, verse 1, which we heard earlier, we were dead. That's what it says. We were dead, spiritually speaking, in our transgressions and sins. Dead people are not able to see but instead of leaving us in this state, God reached out and raised us to life, spiritually. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So even though we were enemies who rejected the truth, who were dead in our sins, God decided to reach out, to raise us from the dead, to give us a heart of flesh, to fill our bodies with the Holy Spirit and the gift of faith. Our God who raised Jesus from the dead and who raised us from the dead spiritually, one day physically as well, can obviously also raise unbelievers from the dead. In his sovereignty, yes, he is the one who closes eyes. He is the one who hardens hearts. But in his grace, he's also in the business of opening eyes. We can testify to that. We were once blind. But now we see. God did that for us, and he is continuing to do that for, for others. 
Now regarding the, the guards at the tomb, our passage, it concludes with them taking the money and then doing as they were instructed. But do you know what happened to these guards only three months later after this? I don't know. I was going to ask you. I'm hoping you did. <laughs> but you don't. Okay. I don't either. We don't know what happened to, to these guards. But I wonder if we could just take a minute to imagine what might have happened months later after Matthew 28. I wonder if what, what if, what if God eventually opened the eyes of one or more of these guards? I mean, picture this. Months later, one of the guards is having a hard time sleeping. And the guard is having a hard time sleeping because this guard knows what he saw that day. He saw an angel of the Lord. And you couldn't convince him otherwise. And he knows that what he is doing is spreading a lie. He knows that. He knows he took the money to do it. And that's what he's been doing. But this is eating at him. He can't sleep. And so he begins to wonder. He begins to ask questions. What happened to the body of Jesus Christ? Sometime later, he runs into a, a fellow who calls himself a follower of the way. And this is no surprise. The city is beginning to swell with these people. And so the guard asks this, this person about what happened to the body of Jesus. The guard knows that the body couldn't have been stolen. So what happened to the body of Jesus? The believer looks at him and says, haven't you heard? He is risen. Now I'm making all that up. We have no idea what happened to those guards. But we do know what happened to thousands of spiritually blind, hard-hearted people after the resurrection. Just read through the book of Acts. Thousands of people had their eyes opened, including a spiritually blind, hard-hearted man by the name of Saul, a.k.a. the Apostle Paul. All that to say, God does close eyes, God does harden hearts. That's what the Bible teaches us. But he also opens them. He is in the business of raising people to life, opening eyes, giving them a heart of flesh and a gift of faith. Now let me ask you a question. And this is a question that you might want to think about, maybe, maybe in the weeks to come. Has the Lord opened your eyes? A person may say, yeah, of course he has opened my eyes. Unlike those guards in Matthew 28, I do believe Jesus rose from the dead. But to rephrase the point that James makes in his epistle, James 2 verse 19, is not the resurrection of Christ something that the demons believe? Yes, of course. The point is that just because a person says they believe doesn't mean they actually believe. There are many Christians today who say they believe Christ has risen, yet their eyes are still closed. Their lives have not been transformed. They are lukewarm in their faith. Their mind is set on earthly things. And they find the resurrection story just a tad boring. Unfortunately, these, these Christians who say Jesus has risen, they, they don't actually believe it. Now, if you're listening and you know deep down in your heart that this is true for you, here's the, here's the good news. You can ask God to open your eyes and he will do it. For free. Matthew 7, verse 7. This is a verse about salvation, not BMW vehicles. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. 
And there are, are those here this morning who can testify to God's grace and his amazing gift of faith. He has opened our eyes and we can see, we can see and believe this incredible life-changing story, which we love. Jesus has risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Here's another question that I want to throw your way. Do you know anyone today in your life who does not believe that Jesus rose from the dead? If so, why don't you ask the Lord to raise that unbelieving person to life? And don't just ask them once. Don't ask the Lord once. Ask the Lord again and again and again and again. And don't just ask. Plead. Beg the Lord to do this. To open the eyes of your loved one who at this time does not believe. Now, like I said, the Lord does soften hearts and opens eyes. And, and here's the thing. He uses us to do it. We are the instruments. We are the tools by which he does this. And don't be offended that I just called you all a tool. Jesus says to us, says to you at the end of Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations. We are called to go and scatter the seed. And the Lord, he prepares the soil. Now, maybe you're thinking right now, I can't do this. I can't do this because I wouldn't even know what to say. What would be the, the life-changing, eye-opening, heart-softening message that would bring people to Christ? Here it is. Three words. He is risen. Let's pray. Father God, we don't have the words to express how grateful we are that you raised us from the dead. Lord, we were once blind. We once were your enemies. We rejected the truth. And yet you did not send us a powerful delusion to keep us in the dark. But you brought us into the light. And we do not deserve this. And yet you have done this for us, Lord. You are a God who loves us. You are a God full of grace. And Lord, we know it's not going to stop with us in our lives. You want to keep doing this, and you want to use us to do it. And so I pray that you would give each of us an opportunity to point to you, sharing the, the life-changing news that Jesus, our Savior, gave his life on the cross to pay for our sins, and then three days later, rose again victoriously from the grave. Thank you, Father for all that you do and continue to do. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. At this time, our praise team is going to lead us in our song of response, In Christ Alone. When the music begins, I invite you all to stand as we sing this together. Thank you. 
Before we pour our hearts in prayer to the Lord, just a couple of announcements. One is that it's uh, Jerry Heidbert's birthday today. It's his 80th birthday, and so I'll be praying for Jerry and, and uh, Lucy in, in the prayer this morning. Uh, also, just an update on Tex and Dorothy Mass, uh, who you've been praying for. Um, D Dorothy had a detached retina in her one eye, and then she uh, had that dealt with. And it's, it, it's improved, but there's still complications in that, in that eye. Now she's having the same problems in her other eye. So the same issue, detached retina, so she'll have to get that treated as well. So please keep Dorothy in your prayers. That's Helen Rump's sister. And then with, with Tex, uh, there's a number of, of health concerns. And I guess the, the, the latest big problem that he's, he's had is that he had a, a hip replaced a couple of weeks ago, and it actually broke, the one that was replaced. So he had to go in for surgery, which happened yesterday in Brampton Hospital, and the surgery was successful, so that's good. But if you can just keep Tex and Dorothy in your prayers this week, that would be much appreciated. And let's pray for them now. Father God, we are not only grateful that our Lord Jesus has risen from the dead, but that you have opened our eyes so that we can actually see and believe this and have our lives transformed by this truth. Lord, we, we believe this and we know people in our lives who don't believe this yet, and so we ask that you would open their, their hearts. We beg you to do this, Lord. Please bring them to life so that they'd be able to experience the joy and the hope that we know, having Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Thank you for all the ways you bless us, Lord. You give us so much. You give us life. We, we thank you for Jerry Heidbert, who you have blessed with 80 years. Please bless Jerry and Lucy on this special day. Lord, you, you give and you take away. And Lord, you have called home your servant, Teeny Vandenberg, this past Thursday morning, and so we want to pray for the family as they mourn. Uh, but also, in addition to mourning, there's this feeling of celebration, knowing that Teeny is in paradise, in your hands, having the time of her life. And so we celebrate, and we are so glad, Lord, that Teeny is in your hands. Lord, we pray that you would physically restore Jan Bonds and be with the entire family, Lord, as they continue in this uh, difficult journey, I pray that you would strengthen their faith and keep their eyes fixed on you. Please bless John Luff and Alice, and we pray, Lord, that you will provide John what he stands in need of, the bypass surgery and a lung transplant. We pray that these things would happen and that they would happen soon, and that you would give John strength and, and patience as he waits on you. Please also bless Eldon and Julie Westendorp as Eldon has health issues and is currently undergoing tests. We pray, Lord, ultimately that you will restore Eldon and bless both Eldon and Julie watching over them during this time. Uh, thank you for watching over Hank and, and Bert Kederberg. We ask that you will continue to do that. Please help Bert get his driver's license back. We ask for a blessing on Tex and Dorothy Mass. Uh, Dorothy with uh, the frustrating eye problems, we pray that, that you would just be with her and heal the other eye, heal, heal both eyes, just uh, give her uh, vision, physical vision. Please also uh, bless Tex with recovery as he is in the hospital having had that surgery. We thank you that he had the surgery and that it was successful, but we pray that you bring him to his feet and completely restore him. We pray the same for Catherine Van Donkersgood as she con continues in her battle against cancer. We pray that she would experience victory. Please be with her, her parents as well during this time. Please give them what they stand in need of. We also ask, Lord, that you would bless Lisa John and Janet Kederberg's niece uh, with the strength that she needs to endure 
radiation treatments. We pray that the treatments would be successful and bring about healing. We also, Lord, want to continue to remember what's going on out east as the war in Ukraine continues. Lord, it's just awful to, to see and hear the news. But Lord, you are sovereign. You are in all places. We know you are there. And we ask, Lord, that you would bring about peace. Please provide, Lord, for those who have suffered loss. Please provide uh, for those who, have, who are suffering in any way. We pray, Lord, that you would heal what has been broken. And yes, ultimately bring about your peace. Lord, in this service being reminded and us celebrating what you have done through Jesus, our risen Lord, I pray that we would go this week living for you, looking for opportunities to serve you and to bless you so that you would be glorified in our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The offering this morning is for the church budget as well as Resonant Global. You can give online or you can give on your way out. At this time, we're going to have uh, the blessing followed by our closing song. But before I give you the blessing, I just want to share a few words as I did in our Good Friday service. Uh, you remember in our Good Friday service, we handed out nails. And, and why? Why did we do that? Well, because as I was, as I was uh, explaining, it was our sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. And so this morning, um, we're going to hand out something a little bit different. This, I believe, is a white carnation. I'm not a flower expert. White carnation. And we have one of these per family. We don't have enough for, for every individual person, but one per family. And after the service, we're going to be handing these out to you, to your families, for you to take home. And why are we doing this? Why the white carnation? Well, according to Google, <laughs> which is how I write my sermons, <laughs> the white carnation symbolizes innocence and purity. Innocence and purity. Now, as we were reminded in, on Friday in our, our Good Friday sermon, Jesus, our sin nailed Jesus to the cross. But while on the cross, he paid the price. He suffered God's wrath. So now, we, the sinners, are innocent and pure in God's eyes. That's true. Hebrews 10, verse 14. I love the way it's, it's, it's worded there. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Regardless what you did, regardless your addiction, regardless the sins you've committed, Jesus Christ paid for your sin. You are perfect. Hebrews 10, 14. You are innocent in God's eyes. How do you know this is true? Everything I just said. Because Jesus has risen. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, none of this is true. But if Jesus rose from the dead, and he did, this is true. You are innocent, you are pure, you are forgiven in God's eyes. It is by grace we have been saved. At this time, I ask you to, to stand for the blessing. <clears throat> the blessing from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. <coughs> may the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity. 
and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, he blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Please continue standing as the praise team comes to the front and leads us in our closing song, Cornerstone. Say. Yeah. 